It has to be one of the most successful advertising campaigns that's ever been conducted. I mean, by the time you finished with their commercials, you knew the company name, you knew what it was that they did for you, and you knew how to contact them. I mean, when I mention the name, the, the commercials will start coming to your mind. It was a company called J.G. Wentworth. And what J.G. Wentworth would do is if you had a structured insurance settlement, if you had an annuity, and you wanted to get the money more quickly out of that, then J.G. Wentworth promised that they would be able to do that for you. Uh, their opening tagline was, it's your money, use it when you need it. And then they would have this parade of men and women who would either scream out of windows, they might scream down the street, they might scream out of their car. Uh, the, the last several more recent car uh, commercials, they're, they're singing it in an operatic fashion, but they would scream at the top of their lungs, it's my money and I need it now. And just about everyone will remember the particularly whiny man that would scream out of his window, it's my money and I need it now. I mean, it appeals to our culture's uh, refusal to wait for anything. It, it, it appeals to that instant gratification that, that comes naturally to us. I mean, why should you wait for that money? Why should anyone wait? Well, when Jesus said, follow me, most of the time, his call was for immediate action. He said, follow me. He was calling people to come to him now. Uh, we've noticed over the last several sessions those different ways that he wanted them to come to him. He mentions he wanted to come to him for salvation. There was a call to concentration, a call to separation, a call to self-denial, a call to consecration, to imitation, a call to service, a call to counting the cost. And ultimately, as we talked last time, there was that call to himself. But there was one time that when Jesus said, follow me, he didn't call for immediate action. Instead, when Jesus called his disciples to follow him, he gave them certain blessings that would come from following him. But he said, not yet. Those blessings would come later. When Jesus held out this invitation to his disciples, it was a call to a glorious future. But they had to wait. We're going to be in John chapter 13. If you remember, John 13 is the beginning of a, a, a description of Jesus's last evening with his disciples. They would have a last meal together. He would tell them about the Lord's Supper he wanted them to observe, to, to honor his body and to remember his blood. And you, you begin in chapter 13, and John tells us it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. There were several things he wanted to do with his disciples on this evening before the crucifixion. He starts out with this object lesson of washing his disciples' feet as a way of letting them know the way he wanted them to, to serve others, especially one another as his disciples. He talks about this, this crucifixion that's coming and the way he's going to leave this earth. He talks about a betrayer that is going to set everything in motion. And as we get to the text that we're going to be focusing on in this session, starting in verse 31, um, Jesus has just had this conversation with Judas and encouraged him to whatever he's going to do, he needs to do quickly. And so in verse 28, it says that no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to Judas. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. And as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Now notice what happens in the next several moments after Judas leaves. Verse 31. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. 
A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In just a few hours, Jesus would submit to death on a cross. And with that, he would finish his rescue mission for which he had come to this earth. And Jesus wanted to prepare his disciples for these days of grief and confusion that were coming and to equip them for the mission that he would then send them on as they continued the work that he began while he was here on the earth. He had openly said for months that he would be going away. He had told his disciples, he had told the Jewish leaders, he had told the crowds that there was going to come a time whenever he would no longer be with them. He was going to be put to death by the Jewish leadership, that he was going to be buried in a grave. But three days later, he would raise to life. And so Jesus again tells them plainly, my children, I'm only going to be with you a little while longer. You're going to look for me. And he says, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now where I'm going, you cannot come. It was no secret. He had been very open about it, even with the multitudes, just as I told the Jews. But now he wanted to share with his disciples some very important blessings that were going to come their way because he was about to go back and be with the Father. But again, as they followed him into these blessings, they were blessings that were not going to come just yet. He was preparing the way, but the way was not prepared just yet. Well, Peter couldn't live with this ambiguity. They really didn't understand what he was talking about. And, and Peter couldn't handle it anymore. And so he, he asked the Lord, says, Lord, where are you going? Maybe they were thinking back in terms of Enoch or Elijah, great men of God who, who were taken up into heaven and, and did not die. They were not seen anymore. Maybe that's what they were thinking of. Maybe they're just confused. Jesus, you've come here to the feast. You've come to be the Messiah. You're going someplace else. Where are you going and why can't we come with you? But, but Jesus doesn't really answer Peter's question when you look at his reply. He just repeats what he's already said. Where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will later. It's a, it's a message that Jesus had also given the Jewish leaders whenever they asked similar questions. Where are you going? Back in John chapter 8, verse 21, to those leaders, Jesus actually had a warning. He said, I'm going away, and you will look for me, and you're going to die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. To the disciples, he had a much different message. He actually gave them a promise. It starts out the same way. Where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but... You will follow later. Jesus' command to follow had always implied an immediate response, but this time was different. Jesus said, follow me, but not now. You're going to follow me later. And Peter's reaction brings to mind those J.G. Wentworth ads. Again, Jesus said, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. When you get behind the language that Jesus uses and Peter uses as they have this dialogue, there are two different words that the two of them use for what our English Bibles will translate with one word, now. Jesus, when he says, you cannot follow me now, what he's saying is you can't follow me at the present time. At this particular moment, you're not going to be able to, but later you will. Peter uses a much stronger word for now. When, when Peter asks about why can't we follow, 
he uses one that more sounds like, why can't I follow you right now? Why can't I follow you immediately? Jesus wanted them to follow later, but Peter insisted that whatever Jesus had in mind, he wanted to receive at once. He wanted to receive without delay. I mean, the reactions that Thomas and Philip are going to show here after a while in the same section uh, show that the other disciples were feeling similarly. I mean, why do we need to wait? I need your promises. I need your blessings, and I need them now. But they weren't ready to follow. That was Jesus' message to Peter. He says, will you really lay down your life for me? I mean, very truly, I, I tell you before the rooster crows, you're going to disown me. Peter, you're not really ready to follow me immediately, right now. But you will. You need to wait. The way had not been prepared. You can't follow me yet. But you will. So Jesus turned from Peter and he, he turned to the rest of the disciples. It's indicated in chapter 14 and verse 1 because that pronoun your in this passage, it's a plural pronoun. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. The, um, the word that he uses here, the form of the verb he, use, he uses here implies stop being troubled. Set your hearts at ease. I know you're troubled right now. I know things are very difficult right now, but, but stop being troubled. And, and how are they to do that? How are you to stop being troubled? Well, he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. The, the, the words he uses here are much more of an imperative. Believe in God. Also, believe in me. If you don't want your hearts to be troubled, trust me. You're going to follow, not yet, not now. You're going to follow later. And I know that that waiting period, not knowing exactly what's going to happen, how all this is going to work out, it's very troubling to you. But trust me, you will follow later. I mean, when you follow Jesus, do you come to those moments in your life whenever you just things are just not making sense? You don't know why things are going like they are. You don't know why you have to, to wait for certain things to happen in your life. You believe the promises of God. You believe that God's going to do good things in your life, but you're kind of like uh, David in some of the Psalms. How long, O oh Lord? How long must I wait for you to act? And we have similar questions of Jesus whenever we're following him as his disciples. He says, not yet. Just wait. And meanwhile, trust me. Don't, don't let your hearts continue to be troubled. Don't Be at ease because I'm at work. My father's at work. This will work out because I've called you to a glorious future. It, it was more than just a pious wish on Jesus' part. It wasn't just may your hearts be not be troubled any longer. It was more demand, and it was based on a solid foundation. It was that belief in God and in Jesus. Notice, he, he's exhorting them not, not to be troubled anymore, not to be tempest-tossed, agitated, thrown into a state of confusion and perplexity. I mean, the heart, as he's talking about here, is more than just emotions. It's actually that which, which is at the foundation of who we are and everything that we do, our words and our actions. And so he's saying, don't act out of a troubled state. Act out of a trust in me. I mean, they had plenty to be troubled about. They had all these emotions they were dealing with. They were sad because of the gloomy prospect of Jesus leaving. They were ashamed because of their own demonstration of selfishness and, and one-upmanship and pride. They were perplexed because of the prediction that one of their own number was going to betray Jesus and the rest of them were going to desert him. They were wavering in their faith probably thinking something like, how can one who is about to be betrayed be the Messiah? And so Jesus goes on to explain five blessings that are theirs because they're following him. But they are blessings for which the way needed to be prepared. Follow me. You will follow me, but not yet. Just wait. Now let's look at these five different blessings. The first one we've already read. Go back up to verse 34 of chapter 13. He says, A new command I give you, love one another. 
As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. This important instruction, one of the most important instructions that Jesus gave to the disciples, he, he calls it a new commandment to love one another. And new does not mean that it's something recent. It doesn't mean that it's something that has never been mentioned before. Instead, it just refers to a freshness. It's, it's going to be given a new start, a new beginning, uh, the opposite of something that's outworn or something that's been, um, been neglected over time. And what he's actually telling them is, I'm inviting you to a new way of relating to one another. He says that new way of relating is actually based not on law. It's not based on command. It's based on a relationship that they have with Jesus. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. One of the blessings they're going to receive is that as they watch Jesus express his love and demonstrate his love for them, as he pays the price in this rescue mission that he came for, they are able to demonstrate that same kind of love for one another. They get to be a part of a community that exercises and practices that kind of love to one another. Jesus mentioned it in a similar way in a different place over in Mark chapter 10. We, we discussed this story several sessions ago where Jesus talks with a rich young man. And, and Jesus tells the young man that he is invited to follow him. But he says, if you want to do that and you want to give your life to me, you, you need to sell what you have. You need to give it to the poor and then come follow me. Because Jesus knew that this man's wealth, this man's riches stood in the way of truly following Jesus. But the man went away sad because he wasn't willing to follow on Jesus' terms. Well, as the man walks away, again, Peter speaks, speaks up, and he considers what the disciples had done as they decided to follow Jesus. And Jesus, uh, Peter says um, in that context, he says, we have left everything to follow you. And they had. We've noticed on several occasions where they left things behind and they followed Jesus. Well, Jesus replied to him, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields from me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in the present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. They could look forward to a glorious future as they lived in this new kind of relationship with one another, a new kind of relationship that was forged by Jesus Christ, by a new standard that was based on Jesus Christ. It hadn't been prepared yet, but it was coming. It was a call to a glorious future. Next, in chapter 14, after Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Notice verse 2. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? This passage has received a lot of discussion over the years. And most of it comes from the use in the English, what the New International Version says, my father's house has many rooms. What, what does he mean by many rooms? Uh, some older translations especially will say, my father's house has many mansions. Some translations will say, um, there are many dwelling places. And then there are some newer ones that actually say, well, there's more than enough room in my father's house. But what is Jesus talking about? Well, when it was first translated mansions, they actually, those translations took it more from the Latin. Because when the Latin translated the Greek um, into Latin, it took this word, it's the word monai in the Greek, and they translated it by a Latin word, mansio. It, it, later, it, it really talked about a stopping place, a place along the way, that as you're making your way to heaven, there are these stopping points along the way. There's, there's many of those there, and, and I would have told you if they weren't there, I'm preparing these for you, these many stopping places. Um, and so this word for mansions, whenever Tyndale took the Latin and translated it into English, he took that word mansions. But, but in the Middle English at the time, 
the word simply meant a dwelling place, not, not necessarily a large or imposing place, not necessarily a very wealthy place. It was just a place to dwell. And, and it wasn't some place of, of temporary, a temporary nature. And so this word um, coming from the Greek then became into the English mansions. Well, more recent English translations have gone back and translated it more accurately, translating it rooms. Or even better than that is dwelling places. This word monet, which is the word for dwelling places, is very close to a verb minnow. And minnow means to remain. And so someone who remains, remains in a dwelling place. Now I say all that because of what Jesus is saying here. Notice what he says again. And let's, let's substitute some of these words. My father's house has many dwelling places. And if that were not so, would I have told you I'm going there to prepare such a place for you? What's interesting to me is Jesus spoke with such calm assurance. That, that he was going to prepare this place because he fully expected that they were going to join him in this dwelling place. It, it's almost as if he's talking about his own hometown. I'm going back home and I'm going to fix up a place for you and, and you're going to come and, and dwell there with me. Now, these same words are also used some other places in John's gospel in a very special way. Back in John chapter 2, whenever... Um, this, this statement about my father's house, Jesus uses that phrase, that term, when he's talking about the temple. Remember, he says, you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves instead of the house of prayer that it's supposed to be. And then later in chapter two, Jesus is referred to as the temple. Jesus' body is this temple, one that's going to be torn down and is gonna be raised back up again in, in three days. In John chapter 8, Jesus says in verse 35, Now the slave does not remain, that Greek word meno, in the household forever, but the son remains. Again, the word meno, the son remains forever. And so in the imagery of the fourth gospel, it seems that this dwelling place, the father's house, is not so much a location as it is a relationship. Jesus said, there, there is this dwelling place that I am preparing for you. That dwelling place is a relationship with me. It's in Jesus Christ himself. This glorious future is this relationship. He, he uses the same language in John chapter 14 where he said that the Holy Spirit is going to come and dwell within them. He's going to take up residence. He's going to remain with him, them. The same verbs that he uses here. It's much more of this coming into a more permanent relationship face to face. In fact, that's, that's the language that he's going to use here in just a moment as he talks about this glorious future that you're being invited to, this permanent dwelling place. It's a permanent dwelling place that is lived in relationship with Jesus Christ. But the way hasn't been prepared yet. It's a glorious future to which you've been called. I want you to follow, but not yet. Third thing he says, notice verse 3. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Jesus gives this promise to return. Now, the, the promise to return is a counterpart to him going away, him, him going back to his home. And so it also describes the character. It's referring to Jesus' second coming. And he says that glorious future is coming, but it's one that you must wait for. But whenever it happens, there's going to be this glorious reunion that takes place. He says, I'm going to come to take you. Now, notice he doesn't say, as, as we might expect, he says, I've, I've got these dwelling places that I'm preparing. Uh, I, I, if if I, I weren't doing that, I wouldn't have told you I'm going to go do that. But now he said, what you'd expect him to say, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be there in your dwelling place. He doesn't say that. He says, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Jesus is talking about that 
relationship that will continue for an eternity. And he assumes that the disciples are going to understand what he's talking about here. You know the way to the place I'm going because the way to the place is right here in front of you. It's me. Thomas objects, Lord, we don't even know where you're going. How, how can we know the way? And, and Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. See, Jesus says, not only is the dwelling place me, I am the one preparing the dwelling place. I'm getting it ready for you. And because I am the destination, I am the preparation, I'm the way to get there. I'm the one that you must follow. Philip speaks up. Show us the Father. That's going to be good enough for us. So Jesus says in verse 9, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. I invite you to follow me, Jesus says, because there's a glorious future in store for you as you do great things. There's going to be a power there for you to do great things. And not only is it the great things that I've been doing, it's going to be even greater. They had been seeing the things that Jesus had been doing. How could it possibly be greater? Well, there's one thing that Jesus would do that none of them could do. He was preparing the way by going to the cross. Now he says, after I'm gone, you're going to be doing greater things. Well, how could that be? Well, there's a couple of different ways that that came about. Number one, he explains to them later on in his discourse with them at this Last Supper that once he is gone, the Holy Spirit is going to come. He's going to indwell them. He's going to give them what they need in order to serve and do the mission that Jesus has called them to do. By that power of the Holy Spirit, they won't have to worry about what to say. They're not going to have to worry about what to do because the Holy Spirit will be there with them. Uh, it's that power that Ephesians 1, Paul says, it's the same as the mighty strength that the Spirit exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. We also see the greater things because you think about it, and Jesus' mission was limited. I mean, he, he limited it primarily among the Jews. And really, his converts? <laughs> Relatively few. But when the disciples would go out, they would go outside the boundaries of the Jews. He would go out to Gentile. They would go out to Gentiles as well. And as far as bringing in disciples, they brought in more disciples on the first day, the day of Pentecost, than Jesus had his entire life. They would do greater things. All they had to do was follow him. But realize they couldn't follow this just yet. And then the last blessing, verse 13. I'll do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask any, me for anything in my name and I will do it. This passage has been misread and mistaught and misapplied so many times. Too many Christian teachers and preachers have used this to represent the false gospel of health, wealth, and prosperity. Uh, ask whatever you want to, and if you have enough faith, it's going to come to you. It's, it's very similar to the J.G. Wentworth commercial. Um, I need it, and I need it now. But that's not what Jesus says. There's two aspects about these prayers. Number one, they're prayed in Jesus' name. The prayers that are offered by the disciples are those that agree with the will and the character of Jesus Christ. It's like Jesus said in the garden, not my will, but your will be done to the Father. And so it's got to agree with the character of Jesus Christ, his desires, his purposes. And then he says, not only is, do you ask in my name, but so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The promise of answer to prayer is there to glorify God, not the gratification and the, the uh, indulgence of disciples. It's so that Jesus' mission on this earth can be accomplished through his disciples to bring glory to God 
and to accomplish his purposes in this world. And so what Jesus is saying is when you're praying to accomplish this mission I'm going to give you, when you are praying to accomplish my purpose for you, you have the assurance that I'm going to answer affirmatively. And with that, true disciples of Jesus are pleased. The power of disciples originates in prayer. But it is a power that is a part of this glorious future Jesus has called them to. But they had to wait. See, the call to the glorious future was one that had the cross in view. Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, and then his ascension to the Father opened the way to this new way of discipleship through this open and right relationship with God. For the disciples who received this call initially, it was indeed a glorious future that was a future reality for which they had to wait. You can't follow me yet. I'm preparing the way. It's the way of the cross. But afterward, then you're going to be able to follow. For us, on this side of the cross, so many of these promises that Jesus mentions are now a present reality to us. They have some uh, aspects of a glorious future still for us, but there are parts of it that are that present reality. As you consider these five blessings, which of these can disciples of Jesus experience now? And, and which ones have this aspect of a future hope at the present time? I mean, every one of them, to a certain extent, can be described that way. A community of love, that's one that we experience now. And yet it's one that as we go deeper into Jesus Christ and we go deeper in being transformed into his image, we experience more and more. We've got this glorious hope that it will become greater and deeper in love for one another. We talk about this permanent dwelling place, which is a presence with Jesus himself. And the book of John describes this eternal life as a present reality that continues on into eternity. It is a quality and state of life that we experience now as we live in the presence of Jesus Christ. But it's one that we experience to a greater degree as we grow and as we mature, as we're transformed more into his image. We do look forward to that promised return. But we live in that promise presently as a certain um, uh, promise that we know is coming. We, we don't question it. We don't wonder if it's coming. It's coming. And so we can live our lives in full assurance because Jesus is coming back. He's given us that power to do great things, even greater things than Jesus himself did while he was on the earth. It, it's more of a spiritual application of the life that we're able to live out and to live into others as Jesus and his spirit live through us. We can do great things. And those great, great things become even greater as we become more transformed in the image of Christ and take on his character more and more every day. And we have that guarantee for answered prayer. And the more that we understand the will of God, the more we understand the will of Christ, the deeper we go in that prayer life. So that I can truly pray, as we've prayed here at Greenlawn several times, Father, Help me to love the things you love. Help me to hate the things that you hate. Help me know the difference between those things and help me live out my life in that reality. See, some blessings are experienced in part presently. Some are realized more fully as we mature more as a disciple. But we get impatient, don't we? We want it all now. We want it right now. And, and we, we sometimes get tired and we get weary. Maybe that's why Paul said, don't, don't become weary in doing good. Paul also understood it is a process. He talked about pressing on. He talked about not always not being there yet, not having arrived, but, but continuing to press on to grab hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of him. In Philippians chapter 3. So what ways do you need to answer Jesus' call for a glorious future? When have you needed it most in your life? When are those times whenever you've been discouraged because of the wait, but you've needed to hear his call to a glorious future? When have you been impatient with the promises of God, needing to, to step back and trust him rather than trying to force things from him? How are you answering the call to a glorious future more fully? 
both experiencing those present realities, growing in those present realities as you grow more mature in your discipleship in Jesus Christ, but also looking forward to the way that those things will continue to, to be a part of your life and more real in, in your life as you, as you get closer to him. The sad thing about this passage comes all the way back in verse 30 of chapter 13. Because we started out, verse 31, we started out with these words, when he was gone, Jesus said. There was one person at the Last Supper who missed out on this call to a glorious future, missed out entirely. Judas failed to wait. Judas failed to put his trust in the Father and to put his trust in Jesus Christ. He became too impatient. He was interested in his way, his plans, his self-interest. He wanted it now. He stopped growing as a disciple and never experienced the blessings that Jesus had prepared for him and that Jesus was preparing for him. So how will you answer the call to follow Jesus? How will you answer the call to his glorious future experienced now but becoming even greater as we grow deeper in him?